Green. Okay. And this is recording? Yeah, this one is. That one is. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. How are we today? Good, good. Okay, anybody got any questions for me relating to Monday's lectures, lab? Anything? Any guess? We're going to do that today. Yes, I'm going to do that today. That's in the lecture today. That's a repeat slide. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right, so today's two lectures in lab are on cell organelles, okay, which is very basic foundational stuff, but we need to know how a cell is able to carry out its functions and which organelles are associated with those functions. So there's two lectures. Um, basically, after the first lecture, we do half the organelles, and then in the second lecture, we'll do the remaining organelles. So here's our learning objectives. Um, we're going to be looking at organelles and cell specializations, which we, don't, we can't quite classify them as organelles, such as microvilli, cell junctions, cell inclusions in the cytoskeleton but they're all involved in the function of you know, the cell. So we need to be able to list the membrane-bound organelles and the cell specializations, inclusions, and um, cytoskeletal components and junctions, okay? And describe the structure and function of each of those, all of those. And also, I want to spend a little bit of time on the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic uh, organisms, since that's germane to the presence of organelles. Eukaryotes only have organelles. Prokaryotes do not. And so understand the differences between the two and also understand differences in cell division between the two. Okay, and um, that will lead into our understanding of how eukaryotes were formed by endosymbiotic um, fusion, if you like, of two different forms of prokaryotes. And then we'll look at um, some different cell forms of cell division. Um, mitosis, meiosis, not so much meiosis when we do germ cells, and um, the cell division, fission of prokaryotes. So they're the main things, but of course there's a lot of other things that I'll be giving you material on that you also should need to know. Okay, so here is the big picture, okay, big picture. These are, in my view, the milestones in cell biology that have led 
from a primitive microorganism evolved 3.7 billion years ago to you and me, okay? So here are the ma major steps that have occurred. So we think about 3.7 billion, and I'm talking with a B, right? Not million, B, billion years ago, we have evidence of the first life on Earth. Tip usually it is um, some form um, of cyanobacteria um, that has left a deposit um, in in the, um, the, the the fossil record. So that's the earliest evidence that we have for life. Now there are some theories about how you can have a prebiotic origin of life, and Dr. Jack Sorsak at Harvard Medical School has got th at least three different YouTube videos online that are free that you can look at if you want to look at how he summarizes the research on how some people think that um, you could go from a prebiotic chemical um, origin to a actual um, life form. So if you're interested that you can just Google his name and do you know origin of life something like that and you can look at that. Um, anyway, but in any event we know that about 3.7 billion years ago, we have evidence for the first forms of life. And these were prokaryotes, okay, prokaryotes as in bacteria, not eukaryotes, but bacteria, which are very simple organisms. And prokaryotes don't have any cell organelles, right? We're talking about cell organelles today, but prokaryotes don't. They have a nuclear organizing region. The, the DNA is not even bound by a membrane. And they have a flagella and maybe some things on the surface and that so many of them have a cell coat, more like a plant than an animal type cell um, exterior. But that's prokaryotes. Then we think about 2.5 billion years ago, there was an endosymbiotic relationship formed between two different types of prokaryotes to form eukaryotes. That's what we're going to be talking about mostly today. And this was championed by Dr. Lynn Margulis. Um, Many people think she should have got a Nobel Prize for her work on um, discovering endosymbiotic origin of eukaryotes. She kind of messed up um, in terms of she also thought that flagella um, that we see, or cilia that we see in eukaryotes were derived through endosymbiosis from prokaryotes, but they're actually totally different gene products, and so she was proved wrong, so that kind of knocked her out of the running for a Nobel Prize. But the stuff that she did on endosymbiosis has been confirmed many times over. So here then, about two and a half billion years ago, we have a eukaryotic life form. These are the cell life forms um, that have cell organelles. And then the next big step, maybe 850 million years ago, was a metazoan life form. Because these guys here, two and a half billion years, they were single cells. But then maybe 850 million now, when we're talking million, not billion, years ago, million years ago, some of these cells were able to connect to each other to form a metazoan life form, which means multicellular life form, right? And you get multicellularity through the presence of cell junctions. We're going to talk about that in the second hour today. And connective tissue, which I'll be talking about next week. So once you get a multicellular life form, then you start to, uh, of course, if it's just the same cell clumped together, it's just a blob, but you want to differentiate different um, types of organs and tissues. And um, a lot of this was related to the evolution of the homeotic gene family, the Hox gene family, which provide for segmentation. So head, thorax, limbs, abdomen, things like that. And there's a whole field of embryology on the Hox um, family of genes, and this shows you many of them here. And they're very similar, actually, between different types of mammals, between like a mouse and a human. Very similar um, genes. It's just the timing that really timing of when they're turned on and off that determines in many respects um, what the organism ends up looking at, with it, whether it turns into a mouse or a human. And then in addition to this um, body segmentation, we also have tissue differentiation and organogenesis. Okay, so you know evolution of different organs and tissues, which we're going to be basically looking at all of the different organs and tissues um, during the next several months. So these are the milestones that have occurred over 3.7 billion years or thereabouts to go from an extremely primitive microorganism through through eukaryotes, multicellularity, body segmentation, and organogenesis. Okay, 
So 3.0 billion years is a long time. So when you consider this in the context of here we are after 3.7 billion years of evolution, it kind of puts things in perspective. So, you know, some, let's talk about a little bit about philosophy. So sometimes, you know, you might wonder to yourself, am I special? Okay, is there anything special about me? Okay, maybe I could be a little bit better looking, you know, and I would have attracted those, um, you know, partners that I couldn't really sort of connect with. Maybe, you know, I could be a little bit, uh, have a little bit more money, wouldn't have to take out some, some cell, you know, some um, student loans and I could have a nicer car or whatever. You know, maybe I could be a bit healthier. Some of you may have conditions, okay, um, things like that. So, you know, you may think, well, gee, there's really nothing special about me because I know people that have got all those things and I really don't have any of them. But you are special. You are special, every one of you. And you know why? Because here you are after 3.7 billion years of evolution and you are the top of the chain, right? You're not a mouse or a cat. You know, my cat's also here after 3.7 billion years, but she doesn't know, she's not sentient, she's not, she's not, doesn't have the consciousness that we have. She doesn't know that she's here after 3.7 billion years of evolution, but I do. And I'm thinking, geez, how lucky am I, you know? I understand the process by which you can go from an extremely primitive microorganism through billions of years of evolution and wind up as being this sentient human being. So we are very special individually. So every one of you is special, so don't doubt it. If you have doubts about, you know, anything about yourself, just remember how lucky you are to be here after 3.7 billion years of evolution, okay? So you are special, every one of you. Okay. So how did we get here? Well, if we look at the classification of life forms, we can classify it, there's many different ways, but we can classify it at a very elemental level into the domains of life. And two domains are the bacteria and the archaea. These two domains are prokaryotes. And these prokaryotes, a good example of bacteria, you know, bacteria, E. coli, have no cell organelles. And these were the first life forms, okay? And we think about two and a half billion years ago, the archaea acted as a host for a bacterium that invaded the archaea, formed an endosymbiotic relationship to form eukaryotic cells. And this gives you a classification of the eukaryotic cells. And here we are, okay? And of course, the eukaryotic cells have cell organelles. So what's the fossil evidence for this early origin of life? Well, stromatolites are the life form that we have fossil evidence for that goes back about 3.7 billion years. So these are what some people call cyanobacteria, okay? Cyanobacteria or uh, blue-green algae, another name. And basically they are a very primitive, and they still exist today in restricted locations throughout the world, in the Caribbean, in um, Africa, in uh, Western Australia, there are, there are stromatolite um, colonies. And they form a, um, a mat on the surface of a sediment that they deposit, which is photosynthetic. So they're photosynthetic, that's how they could survive at that time. And um, as a part of their photosynthesis, they release um, oxygen. Um, and these, so the, and, and when they do that, they deposit a bicarbonate um, sediment, a calcium carbonate sediment, pardon me. And that cal calcium carbonate sediment as part of their, their life cycle then um, forms can form a fossil, okay? And the, these are the fossils that we're seeing going way back to 3.7 billion years old. And this is in the, geologically, they consider this the Archaean period. So stromatolites have related organisms, thrombolites, oncolites, there's other evidence, algal filaments, um, people have under the microscope found, and spheroidal bacterial structures, you know, we're talking billions of years old. So when you think about it, if you're talking about, thinking about billions of years of, of, of time, you can see how you can evolve from an extremely primitive organism to a highly complex multicellular organism because you have all this time to do it. We're not talking about millions of years. Um, when when um, the, uh, the origin of the species came out, okay, who's the guy who did that? Origin of the species? Darwin, thank you. Charles Darwin has escaped me. So when he published The Origin of the Species, he was thinking about tens, hundreds of thousands of years, okay, for evolution to occur, natural selection. He had no idea 
that the age of the Earth was so, so old. And they only were able to figure out um, the age of various rock strata when they figured out um, uh, radioactive decay, okay, and isotopes and things like that. So, you know, like radiocarbon dating, which is only tens, thousands of years, but I think they used uranium for, for billions of years of, of, um, of dating. So now they know, they can figure out with different elements, they can figure out the actual age of rocks based upon radioactive decay of certain elements. So they know that the, the planet Earth is about four and a half billion years old, and maybe around 3.7 billion, we had some sort of event, whether it was supernatural or whether it was a natural um, prebiotic uh, event that caused life to be formed. So here are what stromatolites look like, these primitive cyanobacteria. If you look at this, these look like a bunch of rocks, right? But they're pretty uniform. And here's the fossils cut through these stromatolites here and here. And you can see how they've deposited these strata of um, calcium carbonate as they photosynthesize and, and um, release calcium carbonate to form these fossil, look like a mound of rock. And if in cross-section, it kind of looks like this. And they look like this in lo the locations where they occur. And, and the cyanobacteria, they just occur on the very surface here. This, not, these are, this is all dead. This is all calcium carbonate. But the cyanobacteria occur on the periphery, and this is what they look like. Okay, And significantly, in this mat of the, of the cyanobacteria, there are also other microorganisms, such as uh, eubacteria, as well as the cyanobacteria and eukaryotes. So this close relationship of these primitive microorganisms is uh, very significant, because through this close relationship, then at some point we had this um, two, two different types of microorganisms form this endosymbiotic relationship to form eukaryotic cells. So here again, here are some of these um, these uh, primitive life forms, thrombolites, oncolites. You know, you look, you might think this is just a bunch of rocks by the ocean or by the sea, but when you look at it, they're quite uniform. And when the tide comes in, you know, they're covered with these cyanobacteria that can then deposit the calcium carbonate to form these uh, rocky-like structures. Okay, so that's the very earliest, most primitive life forms, some of which still exist today, but not very common. So then what we think is, at some point, two and a half billion years ago, an Archaean bacteria, Archaea, was invaded by a eubacteria, which is a different prokaryote, to form a, um, a eukaryotic life form. Okay? Now remember, these two types of prokaryotes, the eubacteria and the Archaea, have no cell organelles, and it's only after um, we had this symbiotic relationship that then we got the eukaryotic cells. So this is how we got the evolution of eukaryotes, which we're going to be talking about today in terms of cell organelles. So basically, we had the endosymbiosis of a eubacteria, which is one type of prokaryote, with an archaean, an archaea bacteria, to form eukaryotic cell. Now, the archaea are the other type of prokaryote that you're probably not familiar with. They're pretty much around a lot of places, but many of them are like extremophiles. Um, they exist in very hot temperatures, like when you look at uh, Yellowstone National Park, you see those pools with those spectacular colors. They, they are archaea. They're not regular bacteria. They are the archaean type um, uh, bacteria. Uh, many of them exist um, deep in the ocean where you have those hot thermal vents, right? Uh, they live, um, you know, they can, they can metabolize, um, they can live under very hot temperatures. They can metabolize um, the, not necessarily um, oxygen, um, or they don't need sunlight, they can metabolize sulfur and things like that as their um, form of uh, metabolism on life. So they're, sometimes they're called extremophiles because of the temperature and different types of um, chemical um, metabolites. So then the archaean was the host, the regular bacteria invaded into, like shown here, into the archaean to form this endosymbiotic relationship. Then we also had infolding of plasma membrane from the outside around clusters of proteins and enzymes, and that gave us discrete cell organelles, which we're going to be looking at. Now, it turns out the archaean, that, that, that different type of um, prokaryote that I just mentioned, contains DNA with introns, promoters, histones, RNA polymerase, transcriptional machinery. It's more similar to eukaryotes. So because the archaea had that um, nuclear material similar to eukaryotes, we think it was the host because it's similar to what our DNA 
has and functions, whereas the regular bacteria was um, the parasite that invaded into that um, archaean. Okay? And then also archaea can glycosylate proteins, whereas um, bacteria can't. Okay? Bacteria don't glycosylate proteins. So because archaea can glycosylate proteins, as do eukaryotic cells, again, that's evidence that the archaea was the host um, and the bacteria was the, was the um, parasitic organism. All right, so then what happened was we had some sort of bacteria invading an archaean, and that gave rise to what we now recognize as mitochondria in animals and chloroplasts in plants. Okay, both mitochondria and chloroplasts are thought to have originally been some sort of bacterial parasite that invaded the archaean. And I'm going to talk more about that and the evidence for that. You might think that's kind of um, a little bit out there, but actually there's a lot of strong evidence for it, and I'm going to cover that again. Okay, so now let's go and look at the different types of cell organelles that we're going to be discussing today. Um, so we're going to be looking at the nucleus first, um, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria, the second lecture, plasma membrane first, and then Golgi apparatus and so on. The centrioles that somebody asked me about, we'll go over all that. So first, let's look at the going from the outside of the cell inwards, the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is a lipid bilayer, shown here. Two layers of lipids, one layer, two lipids, one, two layers, one, two. And each lipid bilayer consists of phospholipid molecules. The heads, shown here in purple, are charged and polar. When I say polar, I mean directional. You can, you can tell one end from the other, okay, as you can see here, because there's a knob here and not here, so it's polar. Okay, and it has hydrophobic tails. In other words, um, it's, uh, it doesn't like water or water-soluble compounds. Okay, that, and then across this lipid bilayer, we have certain proteins. First, we have integral or transmembrane proteins, as shown here. Okay, and these transmembrane proteins function as pores to regulate the flow of compounds into and out of the cell. And they can also act as receptors to initiate signaling from outside of the cell into the cell, like a you know, growth factor receptor or something like that. In addition to the integral membrane proteins, we have peripheral proteins, which can be associated with the integral membrane proteins. These peripheral membrane proteins can be accessory proteins to the function of the transmembrane proteins, or they may be by themselves and they may be some component of a signal transduction cascade when a protein required for signaling to occur. Now, on the outside of the cell membrane, of course, we have bits of these proteins, either integral or peripheral. Peripheral can be on the inside or the outside. Sometimes we have sugar residues attached to them, or most of the time we have sugar residues attached to them. These um, sugar residues can be highly branched and very thick. Remember I talked about the glycocalyx on... Monday, so these sugar residues form um, what we recognize as the glycocalyx. These saccharides, saccharide is just a fancy term for a sugar, and these saccharides can be attached to the um, phospholipids, so then we'd call that a glycolipid, glycolipid, or a glycoprotein, glycoprotein, okay? So then we have these sugars attached to the surface. And then sometimes we can, if with special techniques, which we also looked at on Monday, we can do a freeze fracture of a plasma membrane. We can freeze it and crack it right down here. And then we can look at the external face or the protoplasmic face. So here it is cracked. When we crack that plasma membrane right down the middle, right down the middle of the yellow here, you can see bits of protein sticking through. So this here, this protein would be maybe this or this. Then we say that's the E face or the external face pointing out externally. Or we can see proteins sticking through this way and this way from the protoplasmic face, that is this face adjacent to the cytoplasm. So we can see physically with appropriate microscopic techniques these transmembrane and peripheral proteins sticking in the lipid bilayer itself. Okay, let's look at the nucleus now. The nucleus of eukaryotic cells, 
um, has an inner and outer membrane, and there's a space between those two membranes which we call a cisternae. And we also have some pores in that, um, that uh, nuclear membrane that regulates flow of fluids into and out of them. So if we look at this, uh, these two layers, here's our two layers. Uh, and, and the nuclear envelope then is selectively permeable. It controls the flow of compounds into and out of the nucleus. Now this outer layer, outer nuclear envelope, sometimes is covered with ribosomes. So we then say that the, the, the nuclear envelope is in effect a continuation of the rough endoplasmic reticulum or vice versa, okay? Because there's ribosomes attached to a membrane. The inner nuclear membrane, this one here, um, is associated with lamin proteins, an intermediate filament protein that we'll be discussing in the second hour today. Okay, and uh, usually um, we can see these lamins attached to chromatin if the cell is in a resting state. Okay, that would be the heterochromatin. Okay, and I'll just, I'll, in momentarily I'll tell you what heterochromatin is. And of course we have these nuclear pores that are controlling the flow of compounds into and out of the cell. So sometimes uh, with it, bad luck, you can have diseases associated with um, some of these compounds bound to the nuclear membrane. So this, these nuclear lamins here, there's different types in blue. You can have a um, defect in lamin A gene leading to progeria. This poor kid um, with this um, congenital disease has premature aging and unfortunately it's a fatal childhood disease. So pretty much any protein or gene product that you can identify in a cell may, if it's defective, lead to some sort of disease. Okay, nuclear pores control the flow of, fluid, of fluids and um, mostly proteins and ions into and out of cells. Now, small molecules can get across easily. Larger ones are controlled by these nuclear pore complexes. Nuclear porins, these proteins in yellow, have an eightfold symmetry. If you count them, there's eight of them stuck together. And any protein that wants to go through one of these nuclear pore complexes will have a sequence, a translocating protein sequence, export and import sequence, that will bind to a specific transport protein. Okay, and that transport protein then um, will chaperone, if you like, that other protein across these um, nuclear pore complexes, either into or out of the cell. So here's our nuclear pore complex schematically. Really small molecules like water and ions and things like that can just pass across by simple diffusion. Anything that's bigger will have to be chaperoned by one of those, um, those uh, the transport proteins. Things that are going into and out of the nucleus, um, there's gonna be ribosomal subunits, RNA obviously going out of the, the nucleus, um, chromatins, um, ribosomal proteins, transcription factors, enzymes maybe going in for nuclear function. Yes? Going back to the progeria disease, though, it's fatal not because it only ages physically, but the bodily organs age as well. So I would assume so. I really don't know much about it. But yeah, if it's premature aging, you know, he's going to be an old kid. You know, things happen, things shut down when you get old. I mean, you can see how deformed he is. I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff going on. It's pretty tragic. Nothing you can do about it, really. It's, it's congenital. Okay, so now if we look inside the nucleus, so here is a cell, here's the cytoplasm, this light stained material. Here's our nucleus shown here. And here with the arrow is a nucleolus, okay? Nucleolus makes ribosomal RNA. That's what the nucleolus does. That's the bottom line. Nucleolus makes ribosomal RNA. And if we look schematically inside a nucleolus, we can see some different areas. There's a nucleolar organizing region, which can be described histologically as the pars amorpha that's shown here. And that consists of DNA that's coding for RNA that will be coming off the DNA. Then we have a pars fibrosa, this fibrous region, which uh, it consists of the ribosomal uh, RNA transcripts coming off that DNA, okay? And then when that, RN, that ribosomal RNA matures, it can be bundled into a granule, and that's the pars uh, granulosa, representing the maturing subunits. Okay, so we've got DNA forming ribosomal RNA, 
and the mature ribosomal subunits. So then histologically we can see that. We can see the nuclear envelope at the periphery. This is heterochromatin. Here's the nuclear organizing region, which is the parse morpha. That's the DNA coding for the RNA. We have um, pars granulosa, so that's the mature ribosomal subunits. We also see a nucleolus associated chromatin. We're not 100% sure what that does. Presumably some facilitates the function of the nucleolus, but not exactly sure. And then sometimes you'll see the term nucleonolemma, which is the fibrosa and granulosa. Okay, so that's the fibrous type parts, not the amorpha, which is the DNA. Okay, so the nucleolus assembles and disassembles with the cell cycle, yes? Yes. Yeah, this, this DNA here um, that's, that's coding for the um, ribosomal RNA is different from the uh, somatic RNA that you'll see on the chromosomes in the cytoplasm elsewhere, all right, the heterochromatin. So this DNA is in the nucleolus itself. Okay, the other DNA that does everything else is outside of the nucleolus. Okay? Um, um, it must be. It, there must be one of the chromosomes must code for it. Um, and then it goes in here, but I'm not sure which one. But it is, yeah. It has to be. There isn't any more than the 46. Okay. So chromatin is basically um, the DNA associated with various um, proteins and whatnot. And if we see it clumped, heavy stained in the nucleus, we call it heterochromatin. When it's unwound and lightly staining, we call that euchromatin. And associated with that DNA, we see proteins, which are histones and non-histone chromosomal proteins um, that help to bundle up the DNA in the nucleus. Okay, so heterochromatin, when you look at a nucleus that's stained, the darker stained blotches, that's the heterochromatin. The lighter material in between the heterochromatin is the euchromatin. That's all it is. Hetero and eu, euchromatin is just referring to those different stained areas of the nucleus. Okay, and we can see that here. So euchromatin, okay, this lighter material here. Heterochromatin, the darker blotches here. Right here, here. Um, here's our nucleolus, right? And uh, the nucleolus associated chromatin is here. And then this is the nuclear membrane out here. So DNA can be bundled in various ways. Uh, in the unwound state, we've got a double helix of DNA. And then, in many cases, it's wrapped around histones and non-histone proteins to form these nucleosomal beads. So this is a way just to compact the DNA. And then this um, beads on a string type of arrangement can be further folded and packed like this, okay, compaction. And then, of course, that can be looped. And then it also can be further folded as a condensed chromosome, as shown here in a metaphase chromosome during uh, mitosis. So there's different ways to compact, you know, these incredibly long strands of DNA to get it all into a nucleus. So if we look at the amount of DNA that different organisms have across all of the different phyla, as you might expect, prokaryotes like our bacteria and archaea have the least number of nucleotide pairs. That's the base pairs, right? Least number. Um, and then fungi are eukaryotes, and then here are other eukaryotes. Um, and interestingly, if you look at this, two of them stand out. Plants and amphibians have a lot more uh, DNA than the rest of the organisms that we know about in the world. So why is this? Well, plants, first let's look at plants. Well, plants have to have uh, special uh, genes that code for the chloroplast, for photosynthesis, right? That's something that we don't see that often we do see it in some bacteria. But also, plants are sedentary. So they have to have genes that provide for survival mechanisms when they're sedentary. So if there's um, some predator, like an insect that's chewing on them, sometimes plants will secrete compounds that um, inhibit uh, um, predation, right? Inhibit organisms from eating them. Or sometimes, you know, they're like 
they secrete um, poisons, so animals won't come up to them if they touch it. They they get an, a, a reaction, and they won't. They'll stay away from that plant. Also, you know, plants they can't move, so if there's a drought, they're getting fried. So they they are, they have genes that helps them to survive drought. Conversely, if there's a flood, um, they have genes that prevents that helps them to survive flooding. So because of the sedentary lifestyle of plants, they have these additional sets of genes that helps them to survive under extreme circumstances of, of weather or predation, things like that, okay? Plus also photosynthesis. Whereas if you're an animal, if it floods, you climb up a tree, right? Or if it's, if it's a drought, you get under the tree for shade or you go down to the stream for water, right? You can move. So an animal, by virtue of its ability to be motile, has um, this, this additional survival mechanism. Now what about amphibians? Well, amphibians are unusual in that they have two different life forms during their life cycle. During the, the um, early um, stage, they are aquatic. They're like a little newt, like a little tadpole, like a fish. They have a fish-like um, lifestyle. And then eventually they um, go beyond the newt into more of a frog or a terrestrial um, life form where they're now on land. So they have to have these additional sets of genes that span an aquatic lifestyle, the tadpole, and a terrestrial, more terrestrial lifestyle like the frog or the salamander, some of them get out of water. So then they span the two different, you know, worlds of the water and the, and the land kind of thing. So they have these additional genes. So of course if you're a reptile, you can get rid of all of those genes that are associated with an aquatic lifestyle and just go on with the terrestrial lifestyle type genes. Okay, so now let's look at different mechanisms of cell division. How do all of these different types of organisms divide? So let's first look at our prokaryotes. Okay, our pro yeah, bacteria and archaea. They divide by binary fission. So here's our bacteria. Here's our uh, just a simple circular looped piece of DNA, and it copies its DNA, and it just just uh, becomes loose, and now you've got two identical copies of DNA, the same um, copy of DNA, and then the cell divides, and now you've got two identical bacteria. So basically what bacteria and archaea are doing is they're cloning themselves, right? They're identical. You get a bacterial infection, pretty much every one of those bacteria in your body have exactly the same sequence of DNA. So that is not very good for evolution because you're cloning. You're, there's no genetic diversity amongst those clones. They're all the same. So that's why it took, you know, billions of years for bacteria to evolve into different types of bacteria and then eventually to give us a eukaryotic organisms. And interestingly, when we look at mitochondria and chloroplasts, mitochondria and chloroplasts contain their own DNA, okay, totally distinct from somatic DNA, okay, totally distinct from the 23 pairs of chromosomes that, that somebody asked me about there. They have their own DNA, and it is a um, piece of DNA that um, is pretty much similar to prokaryotes, okay? They have a circular piece of DNA, and when they divide, the mitochondria and chloroplasts divide by binary fission, okay? So right there is a piece of evidence that tells you that mitochondria and chloroplasts, perhaps, if you want to believe it or not, had a, a, as origins as some sort of um, prokaryotic life form, as a bacteria or an archaean. In contrast to the binary fission of bacteria and mitochondria and chloroplasts, eukaryotes divide by cell division. So here we're talking about, you know, the, um, the, the chromosomes um, undergoing mitosis, right? Prophase, anaphase, telophase, prophase, ana prophase metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, those different stages. Chromosomal segregation, crossing, crossing over, well, not, not in mitosis, but in meiosis. And meiosis is basically a doubling of mitosis where you get crossing over of genetic material and significantly genetic diversity. So the prokaryotes, because they're cloning themselves, there's no genetic diversity. Occasionally you get, you know, the occasional point mutation. They got zapped by a piece of radiation or there was some chemical mutagen in with the bacteria and that caused a mismatch repair or something. So extremely slowly, 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 you may have a change in the genome of prokaryotes, or you do, but it's incredibly slow, 
right? So that's why evolution took so long for a prokaryotes. But, but in meiosis and mitosis, meiosis, every single organism is different. Every one of you, most probably, you may be an identical twin, but otherwise every one of you has different genetic diversity. So right there, we've got a perfect laboratory for evolution. Some of you will be more fit, some of you will be less fit. At least in the old days, if you were a caveman, these days I think it's more to do with your mental capacity than your physical attributes. But in any event, because you have such a great genetic diversity, okay, evolution can really run much faster and it's going, you know, it's, it's taking off. Evolution is really accelerating at um, an exponential pace. So there's the major difference between prokaryotes and mitochondrial chloroplasts dividing by binary fission as opposed to eukaryotes that where most cells undergo mitosis and the germ cells undergo meiosis. So during mitosis of eukaryotes, um, there's a cell cycle. Okay, it takes a little more than a day, depends upon the cells. Most of the time, cells are in the growth phase, G1 phase. So that's the phase where cells are doing their normal stuff. They're making proteins to secrete. Okay, if they're a nerve, they're doing nerve impulses. You know, if they're um, you know, maybe an endocrine cell, they're making hormones and secreting it. They're doing their normal stuff. Then at some point, most of those cells will have to divide okay, to reproduce themselves. Then they enter the synthesis phase, DNA replication, S phase for synthesis followed by another short growth phase where proteins are being made for the process of mitosis and then mitosis itself, okay? And mitosis involves the prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis, as shown here. So this is the cell cycle, G1S, G2M, okay? This happens for most cells of the body. Some of them are terminally differentiated, but most of them are. Is that a question? Yeah. That's, that's G0 is you know, when the cells are quiescent. There is a G0, I'm not going to talk about it, because that's, but yeah, there is also a G0 phase where cells aren't zooming through this cycle. And um, basically cells that are terminally differentiated are in permanent G0, right? There are some cells, like some people used to think that most nerve cells can't reproduce, although now we know that some of them can um, divide, but most of them can't, right? So they're in G0. Satoli cells of the male reproductive system post-pubital, they're terminally differentiated as well. So here's our phases of mitosis. I sure hope that you guys have had exposure to this at some point in high school or middle school and on. Right, so interphase, that's when the cells are in um, G1. That's the period of growth. They're doing their normal stuff, carrying normal physiological phases. So then when they decide to divide, the um, nuclear membrane dissolves, disappears, the chromosomes condense, and now we see very condensed chromosomes in the prophase. In addition, a pair of centrosomes migrate then to the opposite end of the, um, the cell. So in metaphase, we see a pair of a, a centrosome, which is a pair of centrioles giving out microtubules, which then allows for the alignment of our chromosomes along an equatorial plane. Then in anaphase, these chromosomes pull towards the different poles, as shown here. And then in telophase, they arrive, and then we start to get a cleft that separates the cytoplasm between um, the two segregated um, regions of chromosomes, and we get cytokinesis division, and now we have two different cells that have duplicated themselves. So that's you know, briefly mitosis, which I hope you all have had before. Okay, so much for the nucleus. Now let's move on to ribosomes. So ribosomes um, consist of a small and a large subunit, and they are responsible for binding messenger RNA and during that process allowing for translation of proteins. So this is how it works. So here's a small and large subunit of ribosome, and then an mRNA comes along and fits between, in a groove between the two ribosomal subunits. And then a transfer RNA brings along a little red dot of an amino acid. So the transfer RNA is transporting an amino acid onto this template of the mRNA. So the mRNA acts as a template 
for the alignment of the various amino acids that's being shuttled over to it by the tRNA. And then as that template um, of amino acids is put together, you get the synthesis of a new protein, nascent protein, as shown here. So the bottom line is that mRNA facilitates the um, translation of protein, in this case in the presence of ribosomes. So we can have three ribosomes and uh, ribosomes associated with membranes. So free ribosomes, just sitting in the cytoplasm by the cell, themselves, typically synthesize um, cytosolic and cytoskeletal proteins. These are proteins that are going to stay in the cell, okay? They're not going to be glycosylated and they're going to stay in the cell. In contrast, ribosomes that are associated with their endoplasmic reticulum, so then we call that rough endoplasmic reticulum, typically synthesize proteins, shown here, that uh, may require further processing, such as glycosylation through the Golgi and um, other modifications. And many of these proteins will be secreted. Typically, glycosylated proteins may be secreted from the cell. So free ribosomes, the product is going to stay in the cell. Ribosomes associated with the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they're going to be post-translationally modified, such as glycosylation, most likely secreted. So this is how it works, at least for the uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum. So here we have our two ribosomal subunits, and we start out with a new polypeptide, a new protein being initially partially synthesized, and it contains a signal peptide shown here. Now this signal peptide prevents, prevents at some point some um, further um, translation. So what happens is this signal peptide binds to a signal recognition particle, and that binding actually um, prevents further translation of protein. Then this complex makes its way to the membrane where it binds to a um, signal recognition particle receptor, this black docking molecule. And when this receptor binds to the signal recognition particle, this causes the, um, the signal peptide to be released from the um, signal recognition particle. So that then allows for the forming protein, the polypeptide, to then move through a, um, a pore in the RER and, and partially be um, pulled and pushed into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so we can have diseases associated with that. So here we have dyskeratosis congenita. So the, here we have um, the dyskeratin gene that's involved in ribosomal biogenesis. If you have a defect in that gene, you have this kind of um, pigmentation, um, hyperpigmentation, hyper, it's different colored pigmentation, modeled appearance of the skin resulting from that particular congenital disease. So moving on now with endoplasmic reticulum again. Remember, endoplasmic reticulum are continuous with the um, surface membrane of the nucleus. Here we see, in this case, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Here's a cross-section through the lumen of a endoplasmic reticulum with these ribosomes around the periphery. Okay, All these black dots are ribosomes. Sometimes, so here's, in a longitudinal section, rough endoplasmic reticulum. Here's the the membranes and here's the ribosomal subunits associated. So that's rough endoplasmic reticulum. If there's no ribosomes, we call it smooth endoplasmic reticulum. You can see the um, lumens of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum in various orientations, a longitudinal or a cross-section, as shown here. So here you can see rough ER with the ribosomes, smooth ER without ribosomes, and quite often Rough ER may eventually be continuous with smooth ER in a different location, as shown in this particular slide. So here's the smooth ER. Again, there's no ribosomes. Smooth ER, no ribosomes. Rough ER, ribosomes. So what are the functions of the endoplasmic reticulum? Well, cleavage of the signal peptide. I just talked about that a few slides back. Um, they also play a role in protein folding, which is required for normal function of many of these proteins. I'll talk about that momentarily. They also play a role in attachment of sugar residues. I'll talk about that momentarily. Smooth ER, okay, in the absence of ribosomes, synthesize things like phospholipids, fats, and steroids. And the endoplasmic reticulum also has enzymes responsible for detoxification of some drugs, okay? 
So protein folding in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Proteins typically need to be folded to have their um, characteristic normal function. And this occurs in rough endoplasmic reticulum as shown thus. So here's our ribosomal subunits. Here's our mRNA. Here's our protein being translated from um, the mRNA. And as this protein is being translated, there is a signal peptide in red that's cleaved off. Okay. So once that signal peptide is cleaved off, then the forming protein is pushed and pulled further into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum, as shown here, and eventually it is released, whereupon that um, translocated protein can undergo appropriate folding to, um, to, to be able to carry out its normal function. Now, sometimes proteins do not fold into the appropriate manner that they're supposed to for normal function, in which case they may be um, ejected from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or rough endoplasmic reticulum in this case, pardon me, and they then are conjugated to the ubiquitin complex um, and degraded by proteasomes in the cytoplasm. So you can have diseases associated with misfolding. So cystic fibrosis, I'm sure most of you have heard of that, is caused by misfolding of a cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein. So that causes these proteins to be trapped in the endoplasmic reticulum. So then, um, because they're trapped, then they get released from the ER and degraded. So then you have a functional deficit of the CFTR protein, and this causes accumulation of mucus associated with cystic fibrosis. Okay, so I also mentioned that um, these proteins, as they're being translated in, into the endoplasmic reticulum, can undergo partial glycosylation, as shown here. So what happens is, here's our partially glycosylated protein making its way into the lumen of the um, RER. And near this forming protein, we have some sugar residues attached via a pyrophosphate linkage to a dolichol transmembrane, shown here. Dolichol pyrophosphate, which means two phosphates, and um, some sugar residues. So then these saccharide moieties are transferred onto asparag asparagine residues, the asparagine amino acid residue of the forming protein, as shown here. Okay. So then we get initial glycosylation of proteins as the protein is being initially formed in the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. There's additional glycosylation that occurs in the Golgi that I'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, here's our Golgi apparatus, shown here. Golgi are continuous, more or less, with the endoplasmic reticulum. And we can see on the Golgi different stacks of membranes. There's a um, cis-forming face, which is the one closest to the endoplasmic reticulum, and a transforming face, which is transporting and secreting the mature vesicles. Okay, and we can see that here. So here's these stacks here are the Golgi apparatus. Here's the cis-forming face adjacent to rough endoplasmic reticulum. Here's the transforming face releasing these large vesicles. Okay, so these now contain mature proteins that have been released from the trans face, trans uh, reticular network of the Golgi apparatus. Okay, now during transport of proteins from the endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi apparatus, we have a shuttling carried out by certain proteins. So the COPE2 proteins, the coat protein 2 shown in red, promotes forward movement of these vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the cis-Golgi network, which is the first stack of the Golgi apparatus. Conversely, you can have COPE1 proteins in blue that promote the retrograde transport of vesicles back to the ER. And that can be because perhaps the proteins were misfolded and they have to go back for another try or inappropriately glycosylated, have to go back for another try to see if we can correct the defect. And we also have a K-DEL receptor in green, shown here, 
which mediates the retrieval of these misfolded proteins. Okay, so here's a KDL receptor floating around. If we recognize a f protein that w wasn't appropriately folded for whatever reason, it's bound by the KDL receptor. It goes into a vesicle um, that has been um, tagged with the COP1 protein for retrograde movement back to the rough endoplasmic reticulum for a second round of um, post-translational modification. Okay, so if we look at the Golgi itself, we can see there's various stacks. So as closest to the ER is a stack we call the cis-Golgi network. Furthest away, associated with the secretion of vesicles, we have the trans-Golgi network. And in the middle, we have stacks which are the cis, medial, and trans cisternae. So as proteins make their way from the ER to perhaps being secreted, they undergo these post-translational modifications, such as in the cis-Golgi network, they may be phosphorylated. Um, for instance, for lysosomal proteins. In the cis-cisternae, there's removal of mannose. In the medial cisternae, there's further removal of mannose in addition of another saccharide, the inacetyl glucosamine. And then in the trans-cisternae, there's addition of galactose. And in the trans-Golgi network, we have addition of N-acetyl neuraminic acid. So all of these modifications then hopefully lead to the mature protein, which then can be secreted. Sometimes, as these vesicles um, are formed and the proteins pass through the various um, saccule stacks of the Golgi, we get the addition of a mannose 6-phosphate marker which is this little green dot. So in the cis-Golgi network, the addition of a mannose 6-phosphate marker to a protein will then cause that protein to be segregated in a lysosome. Okay? So mannose 6-phosphate marker is a marker for segregation into lysosomes, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Otherwise, um, if there isn't a mannose 6-phosphate, then the vesicles um, will be possibly secreted from the cell. Okay, again, this shows you the general scheme. Here's our endoplasmic reticulum, cis-Golgi network, Golgi stacks, trans-Golgi network. Lysosomes will go to um, lysosomal um, secondary lysosomes. Other vesicles will be secreted. So we can get diseases associated with a defect in the Golgi, congenital disorder of Glycosylation syndrome, okay, causes um, glycosylation of, of various tissues is deficient or defective, and this shows up particularly in the brain, as shown here, um, and this can lead to a uh, loss of cerebral volume and obviously brain function. So this uh, is is very um, bad in terms of the outcome. Okay, lysosomes. I want to talk about next. So as I mentioned, during synthesis of lysosomal proteins, if you get the addition, shown here in blue, of a mannose 6-phosphate marker, binding of that mannose 6-phosphate marker to a protein, that protein will then be segregated to a vesicle that will become a lysosome, okay? So then that lysosome um, will stay in the cell and will bind with other vesicles for the degradation of proteins. So typically, Lysosomal vesicles and other vesicles that fuse with lysosomes contain an acidic environment, okay? Here you can see acidification of this vesicle that's being fused with lysosomes. And that acidic environment is necessary for the uh, activity of the degrading enzymes within those lysosomes. So here we see pictures of lysosomes, these little dark dots here are lysosomes. Here's a lysosome here, 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 lysosomes in a cell. And this shows you some of the acidic hydrolases that are present within a lysosomal vesicle. All of these enzymes have their optimal activity of an acidic pH of around 5. So if these enzymes are exposed to a neutral pH of like the cytosol, they're inactive. So you have to segregate these, these um, enzymes in a vesicle such as a lysosome to, in order to ensure their activity and their ability to degrade proteins. So here 
is um, our primary lysosomes. Here are secondary lysosomes that at some point have had a primary lysosome fused with them. And here are vesicles that are coming in that are, we don't call lysosomes. So you might have a phagocytic vesicle. Okay, this bacteria is being phagocytosed, engulfed by the plasma membrane, gets into the cell. Then once that phagocytic vesicle fuses with a primary lysosome shown here, we call it a secondary lysosome, in this case a digestive vacuole. You can also have small vesicles being endocytosed from the surface of a cell. If they have a clathrin-coated surface, we call that a clathrin-coated vesicle. Sometimes the vesicles don't have clathrin around them, so that's just an endocytic vesicle. These are not any form of lysosome. These are just endocytic vesicles. Once, once this endocytic vesicle fuses with some other type of vesicle that has had a lysosome fused with it, then that's a secondary lysosome. So all of these are types of secondary lysosomes. A digestive vacuole that's, that's phagocytosed to bacteria, a multivesicular body that's had multiple endocytic vesicles and primary lysosomes fused together, a general secondary lysosome, again, a primary lysosome fused with it, or an autophagic vesicle where may, maybe this old uh, mitochondria is being degraded and it's being done so by a primary lysosome fusing with this autophagic vesicle. So here is our different types of secondary lysosomes. These are all secondary because at some point they've had a primary fused with them. Okay, and here's our primaries, which are newly formed, and here are other sorts of endocytic vesicles, a, a um, phagocytic vesicle, clathrin-coated pit, or endocytic vesicle. Okay, you can have diseases associated with um, defects in lysosomes. So as I showed you, I showed you some of the lysosomal enzymes that are present in a lysosomal vesicle. You can imagine you've got all of these different enzymes. Any mutation or defect in any one of those enzymes can lead to a, some sort of congenital disease. This gives you a brief overview. More than 50 um, diseases can be associated with um, defects in lysosomal enzymes. I don't expect you to know this at all. I'm just giving you this as an example of what can go wrong if you have a mutation or a defect in a particular um, lysosomal enzyme. Okay. Okay, there we go. So here's our question for the first hour. Which of the following is not a function of the endoplasmic reticulum? Think about the endoplasmic reticulum and what we talked about the synthesis of protein um, with the ribosomes, the movement of that protein into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum and things that happened to that protein once it entered into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. So here are our choices, which is not, not's the operative word, not a function. Synthesis of steroids, is that a function? Protein folding, is that a function of ER? Attachment of oligosaccharides, is that a function of ER? Sorting of mannosic phosphate receptor, is that a function? Or detox of some substances, is that a function? Okay, think about your answer. Okay, in your mind. Okay, remember, mannosic phosphate marker is only added in the Golgi. Okay, let's take a five minute break and at 35. At 25 minutes to 12, we shall start the next lecture. Let's see. How do I expand this guy? This one? Nope. Yeah, this one? Okay. Terrific. I got another battery just in case. Yeah, it's it's red.
I'm going to test you on everything else. Okay. Cell organelles 2. So here's our, basically the same um, learning objectives as the cell organelles 1. Okay. Know the different membrane band organelles, specializations, and so on. Know their structure and function, which is what you're going to get tested on, structure and function. And know some differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So now moving on to the next cell organelle is the peroxisome. Peroxisome is actually a very primitive organelle. It might have been one of the first ones to evolve. They kind of look like a little bit like lysosomes. They're around vesicular structure and there's not any great structure inside the peroxisome. This is what they look like here. Membrane bound, pretty uniform, maybe a little bit different here. And basically they generate hydrogen peroxide, okay? And this hydrogen peroxide, as you might imagine, is used to oxidize harmful substances, so to get rid of any toxins or harmful substances that may have um, been ingested by the cell. They play a role in detoxifying alcohol and other harmful substances. And they also play a role by um, performing beta oxidation of long chain fatty acids. So in other words, they play a role in one of the first steps of, a, of catabolism, catabolism, breakdown of um, long chain fatty acids. Now peroxisomes are formed, you get a vesicle and then some of these proteins that have been transcribed and translated then are taken up by these vesicles and as the vesicle gets bigger, eventually it will split in two by what they call fission. But don't confuse the fission of a peroxisome with the fission of the DNA of a prokaryote, okay? Fission of prokaryotes was where the ring of DNA duplicated itself and divided into two different bacteria. Peroxisomes has got nothing to do with DNA or um, the fission of DNA uh, nuclear material of bacteria. It's just the same word, but it's talking about two different things. Fission in peroxisomes basically is the vesicle gets bigger and then it splits into to form two different daughter peroxisomes. That's all we're talking about in terms of fission of peroxisomes. And as you might expect, there are diseases that can result from a defect in peroxisomes, okay, peroxisomal disease. Again, this turns out to be a, a neurological type disease, okay, ALD. Um, and again, because peroxisomes play a role in catabolism of fatty acids, you get a defect in fatty acid. Um, catabolism, which leads to an accumulation of fatty acids in the brain and as it says here, leading to a vegetative state and death. So that's again, you know, pretty severe but very rare. Next I want to talk a bit more about mitochondria, okay? Mitochondria shown here. Now look at the size of this mitochondria compared to the rest of the cell. Remember, mitochondria were formed as a endosymbiotic um, organism that invaded a, another cell type and they were a prokaryote like a bacteria. And so this is the size of a bacteria compared to the rest of the cell. And if you've ever seen bacteria in a cell or tissue culture, you really can't make them out. It's just like if, if you've got a bacterial in, uh, infection in tissue culture, has anyone ever done any lab um, work, um, volunteer in a research lab? anything like that, and you get your growing cells for whatever reason, and then you get a bacterial infection, and all you see is fuzziness, right? It's because that fuzziness is the tiny, tiny, tiny little bacteria that you can't even resolve at the 100 times or usually whatever it is that you're looking at under the microscope. That just, in, in my mind, it, it reminds me how small the bacteria are and mitochondria relative to a normal size eukaryotic cell. And that lady in the back there, that makes it, makes it relevant to you, right? Now you understand the size of bacteria. Okay, so bacteria and mitochondria. So mitochondria often co-localize with the cytoskeleton, okay? And the, they, they'll stick to the cytoskeleton because they can move along the cytoskeleton um, to different locations in the, in the cell. So here's our theory again on the endosymbiosis of bacteria giving rise to um, eukaryotic cells. So long time ago, two and a half billion years ago, we had an archaean, one of those extremophiles that lives in hot thermal pools or vents or 
things like that, metabolizes um, weird and wonderful, um, there, there can be ha halophiles that metabolize halides, right, instead of um, um, the normal stuff. This archaean then was the host to an invasion by some regular bacteria, and these regular eubacteria then formed what we now recognize as mitochondria in that host archaean. Or if they're a different type of photosynthetic bacteria, they formed chloroplasts. So then through the fusion of these two types of prokaryotes, an archaean and a eubacteria, we had this hybrid cell, which then becomes a, a um, eukaryotic cell, which is what we have. Okay, And this is thought to have happened to about two and a half billion years ago, again proposed by Lynn Margulis, passed away just a few years ago, a fantastic scientist. Um, and this, this, this theory of endosymbiosis was probably one of the last great mechanisms of evolution that's been described. There are many, there's four or five different major mechanisms by which people describe uh, evolution as occurring, you know, like mutation, right, founder effect, things like that. Um, but this was the last one that's really been described that um, led to a really good understanding of how evolution can occur. So what's the evidence? You know, I keep saying this. What's the evidence that this prokaryotic organism gave rise to mitochondria? Okay? Because I'm saying mitochondria are really originally were some sort of bacterial organism that invaded into another prokaryote. So here's the evidence. Each mitochondrion, and chloroplast by the way, contains its own small circular chromosome of DNA. A small circular chromosome of DNA, just like prokaryotes, okay, just like bacteria. Okay? And it also has ribosomes, mRNA, tRNA. These are all similar to bacterial components. Okay? And that DNA in the mitochondria is totally separate from the chromosomal DNA that we talked about that we talk about during mitosis. And it's a small circular um, chromosome of DNA. Secondly, that chromosome of DNA in mitochondria, that circular DNA, um, divides by fission, okay? By fission, just like cell division in bacteria, divides by fission, not by mitosis. So again, the replication of DNA in mitochondria is very alien and different to the replication of DNA that we see in the rest of the cell, the, the um, chromosomal DNA. Secondly, each mitochondrion has a double membrane, okay? And that kind of makes sense because the outer membrane was from the ancestral host and the inner membrane from the symbiotic prokaryote. In other words, it was engulfed. You had a bacteria, it was engulfed by the membrane of the host, so now you've got two membranes, the host membrane and the, the, um, the, the symbiotic organism membrane. And then this is the best evidence, I think. The closest relatives of mitochondria by genotyping are the Rixetia bacteria. So you can compare the genotype of mitochondria to the genotype of all different organisms. And it turns out this Rixetia bacteria is a modern day intracellular parasite, okay, of eukaryotic cells. So you've got a parasitic bacteria that is the closest relative to mitochondria. So again, that reinforces that concept that these mitochondria were originally two and a half billion years ago, some sort of parasitic bacteria that invaded into the Archaean and eventually through further evolution became a mitochondria. So there's a lot of good evidence to support the, the origin of mitochondria um, as some sort of prokaryote that underwent endosymbiosis to form what we now are eukaryotic organisms. So there's more. Okay, mitochondrial inheritance is maternal, so it's different to regular inheritance because very few mitochondria from the sperm stay in the zygote. So when you get a sperm and an egg fertilizing, the, only the female mitochondria survive, all of the male mitochondria break down. So all offspring have the same mitochondrial DNA as their mother. So I have my mother's mitochondrial DNA. You have your mother's mitochondrial DNA. And your mother had her mother's mitochondrial DNA. 
and back and back and back and back it goes. And remember, this is mitochondrial DNA, which does not change because the DNA replicates by fission. So the sequence of DNA in my mitochondria and my mother's mitochondria and her mother's mitochondria is probably the same. It hasn't changed. So we all probably have more or less the same sequence of DNA in our mitochondria. We could switch mitochondria and you probably wouldn't notice a difference. Now, you will get the occasional point mutation, okay, occasionally. So with enough time, you're going to have maybe somebody 100 generations back, they'll have a slightly different sequence of mitochondrial DNA. So with that, from the field of human genetics, there's the, come the concept of mitochondrial Eve, because what, what scientists did was they looked at the, the mitochondrial DNA sequence of different diverse populations throughout the world, and then they were able to extrapolate back changes in the mitochondrial sequence, as slow as it was, back to this person who lived, this mother, who lived about 200,000 years ago. And so they can, this person, this woman that lived 200,000 years ago, some cave woman probably, whatever, is thought to have given rise to pretty much all of the mitochondrial DNA that exists in the world today. So then we all have a common origin, right? We all had probably the same mother. She must have been, she was either very fertile or she, her tribe was very successful, right? And yeah, you're thinking about 200,000 years ago, there probably weren't many people around. You know, maybe, you know, tens of thousands of, of homo sapiens, not a lot. So it wouldn't take one small group to really be successful and populate the rest of the world um, over time. So then there's this concept of mitochondrial Eve um, that scientists have come up with. The other thing I want to mention here is that human mitochondrial DNA is, has about 37 genes, 16,000 base pairs, and that mitochondrial DNA, as I've stressed, is totally different to the chromosomal DNA in the rest of the cell. Okay, so what about the function of mitochondria? So if you look at the a schematic of mitochondria, we know that there's an inner and outer membrane. And on the inner membrane, we have these knobs called elementary particles. So here's our elementary particles on this inner membrane. And these elementary particles act as proton pumps, hydrogen ion pumps, proton, protons, that facilitate the synthesis of ATP from ATP plus inorganic phosphate. So what happens is, here's our elementary particle, and here's the membrane. So we get these hydrogen ions, these protons, flowing through the elementary particle down a electrochemical gradient. And as these hydrogen ions flow through the elementary particle, one of the proteins of the elementary, elementary particle is this rotor protein in red. And then the hydrogen ions cause the rotor protein to spin in the elementary particle. And that mechanical energy, right, mechanical energy is converted into chemical energy through the synthesis of ADP plus inorganic phosphate to ATP. So by spinning this rotor protein, mechanical energy of rotation is converted into chemical energy in the form of synthesis of ATP. That is what mitochondria do in large part, make ATP. Then these hydrogen ions that have been flowing through are then pumped actively back into the intermembrane space so that then this whole cycle can continuously occur. Okay, and this shows that here, here's our, our elementary particle, here's the hydrogen ions flowing through the elementary particle, facilitating the synthesis of ATP. And as the hydrogen ions enter into the inner aspect of the mitochondria, they are actively pumped back out into the intermembrane location where then they can repeat the process. I'm not going to talk about the function of mitochondria in terms of metabolism. Um, you will get that um, in biochem, I'm sure, ad nauseum. Okay, you can have diseases associated with defective mitochondria. As you might expect, you know, mitochondria play a role. Uh, they, they, they provide energy for the body's functions. So if you have um, what is called ragged red uh, muscle fibers def with defective mitochondria, these patients have low energy, okay, um, 
free radical production, lactic, lactic acidosis, muscle weakness, things like that, okay? Can't tolerate exercise very much. So as you might expect, if you have defective mitochondria, your muscles are weak, and you might have um, the symptoms associated with weak muscles. Okay, so turns out some people do have defective mitochondria for whatever reason. They want to have children, but they don't want to pass along that defective mitochondria to their kids. So there's a new procedure, uh, legal in Great Britain, not yet legal in the United States, where you can make a three-parent embryo. So this is what's done. So here is our mother number one who has faulty mitochondria. So she doesn't want these faulty mitochondria to be passed on to her child. So they take her nucleus. Remember, the nuclear DNA is different from mitochondrial DNA. The nucleus, which contains good DNA, and they put that nuclear DNA into a donor's egg that's had that nuclear DNA removed. So now you've got a hybrid egg, good nuclear DNA from the mother, and good mitochondrial DNA from a donor. And remember, the mitochondrial DNA is probably similar to everyone else in this room and would have been similar to the mother if she didn't have this defect because the mitochondrial DNA doesn't change much with time, right? Because, of, because the mitochondria divide by fission, not by mitosis. So the body's probably not even going to know that, the, that these mitochondria are different, come from a different person. So then you've got this hybrid of nuclear DNA and cytoplasmic mitochondrial DNA, and then the father fertilizes that egg, and then you now have a, um, hopefully a child by in vitro fertilization that no longer has faulty mitochondrial DNA. And this procedure has been performed in Great Britain, and it works. Apparently, the kid's okay. So this is one, I'm sure it's expensive, but it is a <clears throat> way to um, circumvent passing on defective mitochondrial DNA to offspring. You won't get examined on that. Okay, cytoplasmic inclusions. So sometimes we see rounded structures called melanosomes and lipofusion. These are membrane brown. Membrane brown. Melanosomes we um, give rise to um, pigmentation of the skin. Lipofusion is, has several names. Basically, lipofusion is also called a residual body, which is um, a lysosomal enzyme that has digested, digested until nothing's left to digest, and it's just compacted remnant material that's like the garbage tin that's just stored in the, in the cell. So lipofusion has the term residual body or tertiary lysosome. That's the remnants of lysosomal degradation. We also have glycogen and lipid droplets. These are not membrane bound. Okay, these are round, but they're not membrane bound. So if you look at melanosomes, this actually is from um, the uh, non-pigmented epithelium of the retina. Um, but more so, we see it in the skin. Uh, melanosomes contain melanin that can give rise or does give rise to um, some coloration of the skin. You can have um, a defect in the enzyme tyrosinase that um, is responsible for um, conversion uh, to the melanin pigmentation, and then that gives rise to albinism. Okay, so albinos do not have any melanin granules in their skin. Okay, so when if you've ever been up close to an albino, if you look at their eyes, okay, their eyes actually are pink, and that's that's not pigment. That's the reflection of the blood vessels in the back of the eye reflecting out through the, the pupils, okay? So their eyes appear pink, pupils are pink, but that's just a reflection of blood. But otherwise, there's no pigmentation, and so obviously they have to avoid sunlight because they can get fried pretty quickly. Yeah? Um, there's a, there's a, I'm not sure if there's a lack of melanosomes. There's just no melanin in them. The melanosomes is the vesicle that stores the melanin. Um, that's usually, there probably are melanosomes, but there's no melanin. So they kind of, it's like having a empty suitcase. There's nothing in the suitcase, right? Yeah. 
There may be, I'm not sure, but it, it, I guess it depends upon the tyrosinase enzyme, if there's a complete lack of the tyrosinase or if there's a partial um, defect in the activity of the tyrosinase. But I'm not sure about that. If you've read that there are different degrees, then I believe it, because I could see how you could do it. Mixed. So yeah, there probably is a different degrees related to the different degrees of defective tyrosinase enzyme. Okay. All right. So glycogen um, is a store of um, basically of glucose, a conversion of glycogen into glucose. It's a store of energy. So you see a lot of it in the liver, places like that. Uh, here's a section of the liver stained for glycogen. You can see this individual has a lot of glycogen stored in the hepatocytes of the liver. Um, you can also have a disease associated with that, type 1 glycogen storage disease. Okay, um, Too much glycogen is accumulated. You can see the abdomen where the, the liver would be is um, distended because the glycogen is not being broken down, so the liver is getting, getting bigger and bigger. Okay, Lipids. Uh, triglycerides in storage form, so basically in fat cells. So these cells here is one large lipid droplet. This is cytoplasm squeezed to the perimeter on one big droplet. Um, you can see smaller lipid droplets in some cells. So you can see here um, the arrow is pointing to a lipid droplet that's not membrane bound, but uh, for whatever reason in electron micrographs, lipid droplets stain with this dark stain perimeter, and that is characteristic of a lipid, lipid droplet, but it's not a membrane. It is a lipid droplet. And you can also have lipid storage diseases, okay, again, congenital diseases. Too much fat is stored, and if there's too much fat, it can <coughs> cause tissue damage and particularly nervous system damage um, and in other organs as well. Okay. So now let's look at some cytoskeletal structures that are not membrane bound, but we need to talk about them because they are cellular inclusions of sorts. And they come in three different varieties. There are microfilaments, which are actin filaments, microtubules, which are tubulin filaments, and intermediate filaments, of which there are a variety. Actin, a microfilament, consists of globular monomers that can be assembled in the presence of potassium and manganese into this double-stranded strand, if you like, as shown here to form this actin filament. So it can be globular, single blob, if you like, or filamentous when they're aggregated. And this is what actin filaments look like in an electron micrograph in comparison to a microtubule, which is much wider. So here's our actin filaments. So actin filaments do a bunch of things. They play a role in intercellular movement. They're in muscle cells. They play a role in membrane structures, such as the terminal web and in the presence of microvilli. And they play a role in cell movement, uh, locomotion, and so on. Here's some examples of the actin filaments doing out these different functions. So here, sometimes we call these actin filaments stress fibers in red, and they can contract to change the shape of the cell, because they permeate throughout the cell. And by contraction, they can also help the cell to be motile, to move it along. They can have a structural role where the actin filaments can occur down the, down the middle of a microvilli and then interdigitate with, micro, uh, with actin filaments running perpendicular, which is the terminal web. So it's a structural role. The terminal web then is an anchoring point for the actin filaments in the microvilli to stand up straight. Then they can also, actin filaments can play a role in locomotion um, in, the ter in the forms of filopodia. So these little red structures at the edge of the cell, we call filopodia, filled with actin filaments. And these filopodia are motile, so then they can move around to help to pull and push the cell along some sort of substratum. You can have defects in actin synthesis. So if you have a mutation in the actin one gene that instructs actin synthesis, um, you get what is called nemaline rod myopathy, which is characterized here by these blue areas in the muscle cells. Um, and this leads to uh, defective muscle fibers. So 
Um, again, uh, muscle weakness would be one of the manifestations of this disease. Next type of cell cytoskeletal structure is microtubules. Microtubules, shown here MT, are wider than actin filaments. In electron micrographs, they are the widest. And microtubules consist of a heterodimer of alpha and beta subunits that can be aggregated um, to form a microtubule structure, as shown here. So microtubules can occur in, as individual fibers. They can be grouped together as doublets, as we see in cilia, or they can be grouped together as triplets, as we see in centrioles. So as individual fibers, like we can see this mitotic spindle in a, it looks like a metaphase cell undergoing cell division. These are the blue chromosomes um, aggregated toward the um, equatorial pole. And the red lines are individual microtubules that are acting as railway tracks for the um, chromosomes to be pulled toward the equatorial poles. In addition, we can see microtubules as doublets. And we see these doublets in the axoneme, this, the true cilia, motile cilia of cells. So you can see the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. OK, nine of these doublets, and here's a central pair of doublets. So as doublets, we see them in axonemal structures of cilia. If we see them as triplets, that then is a centriole. And a centriole can nucleate a, a um, axoneme. A pair of centrioles occur as a centrosome, which we'd see actually here at the ends of a di dividing cell. And also, um, sometimes we see a basal body which nucleates a cilia, and we call that um, triplet then a basal body. So then we can see microtubules individually as doublets in, for instance, axonemes, or as triplets for instance, as in centrioles. So here are some examples. Again, centrioles, here's a basal body giving rise to a cilia, or a pair of centrioles shown here. OK, so that's one example, microtubule um, organizing center. Here's a dividing cell, a pair of centrioles, which we call a microtubule organizing center. But basically, that is the same as a centrosome, a pair of centrioles. And then we can have a single centriole shown here, um, which can give rise to microtubules, for instance, in a nerve cell. OK, so if we look at paired microtubules in the axoneme, here's the structure of a, a schematic structure of an axoneme. Again, you can see the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules in a central pair. Motile cilia contain a central pair of microtubules. Some cilia lack this central pair. These are called primary cilia. And these are non-motile cilia, but they think that the cilia are sensory in some functions, such as the olfactory epithelium. So the, the lack of a central pair isn't necessarily a, a defective cilia. It might be a primary cilia, which has a, a function of um, sensory function rather than a motile function. So just know that there's, there's two types of cilia motile, central pair, primary, absent a central pair of microtubules. So I think I showed you this. Did I show you this on Monday? Here's some, this is true defective cilia. Here's a schematic of a um, axoneme, the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. And here is a electron micrograph of that. And then you have these two inner, inner and outer dynein arms. OK, and radial spokes, which play a role in motility. In this defective cilia, the inner dynein arm is absent. OK, in uh, this one, the, um, let's see, the inner dynein arm is C, yeah. D, the radial spokes are absent. In E, the central pair is absent, central pair of microtubules. Or in F, the um, both the inner and the outer um, Radial spokes are absent. So you can have different mechanisms by which the cilia is defective and would be non-motile. These are diseased conditions. 
Okay, so much for microtubules. Now the intermediate filaments come in a variety of flavors. We talked about the lamins. Remember that kid with progeria? Um, the lamins, which we associate with the nucleus. We have what we call the vermentins, which are associated with stromal um, or mesenchymal cells. We have desmins, which are in muscle, um, glial fibrillary acidic protein in glial cells, also peripheron in neurons, keratins are in epithelial cells, and neuronal intermediate filaments in um, different neurons. So there are several different types of intermediate filaments that we have looked at there. So the keratins, shown here in red, can permeate throughout the cytoplasm of a cell, and typically they are attached to desmosomes, which are the spot weld type structures on the lateral membranes of cells which holds them together. And there's about 30 different types of keratins, okay, different isoforms. And the expression of these isoforms varies with cancer. So a pathologist will know that this particular tissue has these keratins under the normal condition, and he might be able, they might have correlated the expression of different keratins with progression of the disease. So he might stain a tumor specimen with some different keratin antibodies to figure out where this particular cancer is along this progression, okay? So keratin expression can be useful in grading tumor cells. And um, keratins accumulate in the epidermis of the skin, okay? The keratinocytes are the surface cells of the skin, and they provide resistance to dehydration. Here are some keratin filaments in two ad adjacent keratinocytes. You can see them here, bound to a desmosome. There is a disease, the epidermolysis bullosa simplex. There's a defect in one of the, in a couple of the keratin genes, and these purple are very, people are very sensitive to uh, abrasion, so they blister very easily. So that they have to be very careful in. Um, what they wear on their feet and on their body and, and very careful in terms of um, not having things rub against them, otherwise their skin will blister up. Okay, now the last thing I want to talk about are cell junctions. There's four different types. Zernular occludens occur at the very apical surface between adjacent cells. Zernular adherents occur below the zernular occludens. They hold cells together and form this um, actin um, terminal web. We have desmosomes, I just mentioned them briefly, um, bound to keratin filaments that permeate throughout the cell, and gap junctions, which act as pores uh, to allow small molecules to quickly pass between cells. So zernular occludens, also called tight junctions, occur here right at the apical surface between adjacent cells. You can see in this particular case an electron dense dye has been added to the surface here, the, the yellow dots, and it can't get between the cells because the zernular occludens prevent any further progression of material between the cells. You can do it from the opposite end, from the basal cytoplasm, and you can see it's stopped at the tight junctions here. So basically what that means is because these tight junctions prevent material from passing between the cells, Everything has to pass through the cell if it wants to get from one side to the other. So this also facilitates polarity of the cells, okay? It facilitates polarity. The cells are polarized as an apical surface, as a basal surface, and nothing squeezing between the two. And these zernial occludens form this Ziploc-like seal by virtue of these proteins, claudins and occludens, which um, fuse together to form this extremely tight junction between adjacent cells. And there's diseases associated with the zernular occludens. There's a, um, it's one of the causes of celiac disease is thought to be um, a disruption of the zernular occludens. This toxin zernulin can disrupt the um, zernular occludens, allowing for um, proteins and whatnot to leak between the cells, leading in part to celiac disease. The next type of cell junction I want to talk about are the zernular adherents. These occur immediately beneath the zernular occludens. They have attached to them actin filaments and they form the terminal web which forms this mat of actin across the surface of the cell which also acts as an anchoring point for actin filaments coming down from the microvilli. So actin coming down from the microvilli will anchor into the terminal web which is a mat going perpendicular to 
the microvilli. So zernular adherens, as I said, circle the cell, form this, this belt, a mat um, a, across the surface of the cell in the cytoplasm. And their adhesion to each other is bound by cadherin proteins. Um, and you can see here the, the actin filaments of the zernular adherents. This is what they look like in an electron micrograph. Here's the zernular occludens. Here's the zernular adherents with actin associated with it. And you can have diseases also with a defect in um, zernular um, adherents. Again, another bacteria can disrupt the zernular adherents, um, and you can also get the, um, acute um, diarrhea diseases associated with now the ability of products to pass between the cells because the cells aren't stuck together too well. The third cell junction are the macular adherents or desmosomes. These are spot welds, okay? And these desmosomes, shown in blue, are attached to each other across the, the membrane of adjacent cells. And then on the cytoplasm, they have keratin filaments attached to them, which form kind of a network throughout the cell, okay? And then at the basal cytoplasm, you can have a half of a desmosome which then can anchor into the basement membrane to hold the cell down to the basement membrane on its basal surface. So each desmosome, again, consists of these transmembrane desmoglein and desmocolon proteins. These are part of the cadherin family. These cadherins then are inserted into a dense attachment plaque shown in red that on its cytoplasmic side has attached to it the keratin fibers that we've been talking about. And this shows you um, in hemidesmosomes, you can see now um, the hemidesmosome is attached to the basement membrane, shown here. It's turned sideways, the cell's sideways. It's pointing that way. Okay, you can have um, diseases associated with defects in desmosomes. So this is a heart disease. Um, ARVD, heart disease, where the desmosomes are, um, the desmosomal proteins are defective, and so these people can um, die from, um, you know, a weak heart, a, 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 um, a disruption of the of the right ventricle. Typically, it affects the right ventricle. This was taken from a patient that had a transplant to replace their heart because they had this particular disease, where the cells, the cardiac muscles, aren't held together well, so then, then you can have a rupture of the, the right ventricle. Then the last cell junction I want to talk about are gap junctions. We, these are kind of pores between adjacent cells. You can see it's like a sieve, if you like, but these are very small. They're only very small molecules, water, ions, and things like that, um, 1.5 nanometers or smaller in size, can pass rapidly between cells. This would facilitate um, rapid coordination of cells to carry out um, a similar function. If all of the cells all of a sudden are going to do something, um, it may, that signal may be a small um, anion of some sort that can rapidly zap between a whole chain of cells and say, okay, guys, we're all going to do this at the same time now. The, um, the proteins of the gap junctions are in the form of six connexin proteins, shown here. So six, pro six connexins forms a connexon, and then two in register with each other, they have a pore down the center, then forms an open, open channel between adjacent cells, as shown here. And you can have diseases associated with connexin proteins. A defect in connexin 32 leads to CMTX disease. Um, physical diagnosis includes a foot deformity and these high arches due to weakness of the muscles in the feet. So again, you can have a congenital disease resulting from a defect in one of the proteins uh, forming um, these, these, uh, these cell junctions. Okay, that went a little bit quicker, caught up our time. So here's our question. Which of the following, A, B, C, D, E, is not considered evidence for the endosymbiotic origin of eukaryotic cells? not evidence for endosymbiotic origin of eukaryotic cells. Mitochondria contain their own DNA. 
Mitochondria contain a double membrane, cell membrane. Mitochondria are most closely related to parasitic bacteria. Mitochondria, uh, pardon me, chloroplasts contain their own DNA. Or mitochondria divide by mitosis. Okay, I think you guys know that one, right? Right. We know that mitochondria divide by fission, just like the um, bacteria. Okay, so the last thing that we have today is the laboratory. I suggest we take a 10-minute break and continue on with the lab rather than take a one-hour break for lunch. You okay with that? 10-minute break. On the half hour, we will start up for the lab, and then we will be done for today. Yes. Hard to hear. If you by chance here, would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, yeah, Thank I you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I don't know if that's tedious or not, but no, I'm like, okay. writing stuff to down. And I'm like, I don't even know what this is in regards to. Awesome. So, Thank you. the recording. So, let's see. Are we on? So, uh, lab session. So, we'll go through and look at some more examples of things that uh, we've been discussing. Your chance to ask me more detailed questions. So here we have an electron micrograph of our cilia in longitudinal section up here and in cross section down here. So in longitudinal section, we can make out these long strands of the microtubules. And we can also make out a basal body, right? Remember basal bodies, which is basically a centriole, which has the microtubules arranged as triplets. Right? That's the basal body. So the basal body then nucleates the cilia. And in cross-section, we can see this cilia has the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. Any questions on this one? OK, here's a freeze fracture of the cell membrane showing the protoplasmic and the external face. And you can see these little bumps here, these would be the transmembrane and peripherally associated proteins that are intercalated through or partially through or on the surface of the membranes. So here's, this is the protoplasmic face. This would be the, that leaflet. Remember, we've got a double leaflet of the membrane. That leaflet that is immediately adjacent to the cytoplasm. And we know that because we can see a, a mitochondria here. So this is the protoplasmic face. And then we jump to the, the um, external face, which is, would be the face, the leaflet, that would be continuous with the outside of the cell. OK? That's all they ever do with freeze fracture. They just show the membrane. They smack it down the middle, and they show the two leaflets. Yes? Yes, the external is the underside. Okay. Oh, the underside of the external. Yeah. Okay. You're splitting it down between the two leaflets. So it's the in, in, internal face. Other questions? OK, so intercellular borders. So here is a section of, um, looks like kidney. And you can see this is actually collecting duct. We can see nuclear cytoplasm. And we can see very prominent intercellular borders. Now. This, these intercellular borders, that is, it is not just the plasma membrane, because the plasma membrane would be too thin to show up in a light microscopic slide. What you have there is the plasma membrane with proteins bound to it, which have then stained up to show you these intercellular borders. But it just clearly it depicts where the plasma membrane is in association with proteins. Any questions on this slide? Yes. I might ask you to identify this tubule. I say this is a section through the kidney, but we haven't done kidney yet, so I can't ask you that now. Um, you probably wouldn't ask one for this one because it's pretty straightforward. 
nucleus, cytoplasm, okay, we can't see much else. Other questions? Okay, continuing with the nucleus, another light microscopic view of these are um, oocytes. We can see the nucleus shown here, the cytoplasm, and these are other cells outside here, and inside this nucleus, this dot, is the nucleolus, okay? Now, you're not always going to see the nucleolus in a section through the nucleus because the nucleolus is so small relative to the nucleus that it's in a different plane. It might be behind this section or in front of this section. We just didn't get a section that went right through the nucleolus. So you're not always going to see the nucleolus as we don't here or here, but sometimes we will see the nucleolus as shown here. Questions? And here's a higher power view of the same thing. Nucleus, cytoplasm, nucleolus, okay? Not always going to see the nucleus. Here, we're also pointing out lip effusion. Remember, lip effusion is kind of the garbage bin of tertiary, tertiary lysosomes, okay? Tertiary lysosomes, after everything has been degraded, nothing else is degradable, it's just stored in these tertiary lysosomes within, in this case, um, I think it's a neuron, isn't it? So tertiary, so tertiary lysosomes are also called lip effusion in some cases. Any questions? And you'll see this again when you do um, nervous tissue. Because the, the, um, that storage of tertiary lysosomes is very characteristic of certain neurons in, in certain parts of the um, nervous system. Okay, nucleus. Again, here we have some skeletal muscle. And the arrows are pointing to the nuclei that um, are squeezed to the perimeter of the contractile elements of the skeletal muscle. So nuclei aren't always oval or rounded, as we've looked at in previous slides. Sometimes they're elongated. It really will vary depending upon the cell type. But clearly, if they're stained with a light for light microscopy with hem hematoxylin and eosin, they're always very identifiable because the hematoxylin shows them up to be this purple-blue color. OK, questions? OK, uh, another nucleus shown here. And the nucleolus shown in the middle of this cell. And um, this is um, this nissel substance is base is really um, ER endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi that have stained up really well in this particular nerve cell, and you'll get that more when you do um, when you get the neuroscience lectures. Okay, so if we look at an electron micrograph of the nucleus shown here, we can make out both heterochromatin and euchromatin. The heterochromatin is the dark, clumpy material, either in the center or at the periphery bound to the, the um, nuclear membrane. The euchromatin is the lighter stained areas where the DNA is more unwound. So that's heterochromatin and euchromatin in the nucleus of this cell. And in this cell, we don't see a nucleolus, right? Because Presumably, the nucleolus is in some different plane of the section, either behind or in front of this particular nucleus. Whereas in this particular slide, we do see the nucleolus, right? The nucleolus is here. We see heterochromatin, and we see euchromatin here. OK? And we remember now that um, the function of the nucleolus, its primary function, is to synthesize mRNA, right? OK, here's a nucleolus, which is ribosomal RNA. Here's our nucleolus. 
in this particular nucleus. This is the nuclear membrane, here's the cytoplasm, here's the nucleolus, and this is the pars amorpha, which you'll remember is the uh, DNA that um, gives rise to the RNA. And then this is, um, would be the, the nuclear, the nuclear lemma, which is the non-fibrous components of the nucleolus. So that would be, um, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be the um, pars fibrosa or granulosa. Okay. Mitochondria. See these streaks? Sometimes if you stain appropriately with um, certain stains, sometimes um, fusion, aldehyde fusion, or in this particular case they've used something else. I don't think it says what it is. You can make out these streaks in the cytoplasm of the cell. Here's the nuclei. And when you see these very prominent streaks in these cells, these are mitochondria, which we can see much better here in this particular slide, which has been stained uh, with an aldehyde fusion stain, which picks up these streaky, pink appearing structures, which are very typical of mitochondria in some cells. Okay? And this light microscopic, you really can't resolve the mitochondria with any resolution. <coughs> Pardon me. but you can make out the streaky appearance of them. And then, of course, if they take that tissue and then they prepare it for electron microscopy, they would know that these are mitochondria. Any questions on this one? Yes? I have a question. Hetero and U. So the hetero is always the clumpy material, the dark material. The U chromatin is the light material. Say again? Uh, in this one, there is no heterochromatin. It's all euchromatin. This, this is heterochromatin here. Yeah, next to, the, next to the nucleolus. So hetero is always darker. U is always lighter stained material. Okay, here's our mitochondria in electron micrograph. Um, Remember, the membrane is folded, and in, in a, these cristae that occur within the mitochondria will contain the elementary particles that are making ATP. Okay. All right, any questions on the mitochondria? And then if we look at Golgi apparatus, um, for some reason, I'm not really exactly sure why, if you stain cells that have prominent Golgi apparatus, they stain black with silver-based stains. So this is a section through the epididymis of the male reproductive tract. Here's the nuclei, here's the cytoplasm, here's the lumen, there'd be sperm in here somewhere, they might have got washed out. Stereocilia on the surface, and very prominent Golgi apparatus that have stained black with a silver-based stain to highlight the Golgi. Any questions? Okay, and then looking at Golgi in an electron micrograph, we can see, let's see, this is the Golgi here giving rise to vesicles on the trans face. Here's a mitochondria. Here is some endoplasmic reticulum. This is rough endoplasmic reticulum. This might be more smooth endoplasmic reticulum in a few cases. Okay, questions? Yeah? This, is, this whole thing here is the Golgi. The vesicles are always coming off the trans face, trans as in transport. So the opposite end is going to be the cis face. This, the stacks aren't as clear here, but this would be the cis face back here, opposite the trans face, which always contains the, the vesicles. Yeah, this whole thing. This, these are more vesicles from the trans face here. Back here is the cis. The cis is going to be adjacent to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, 
the rough endoplasmic reticulum glycosylates then hands off to the so here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum here's the cis face a few stacks not very well shown in this one making our way towards the trans face questions yes Smooth ER is going to be any vesicular thing that doesn't look like it has a ribosome attached with it. So, you know, maybe here, maybe up here. It's not very prominent in this one, but I'll show you some. Like here, here's smooth ER between the arrows, no ribosomes, as opposed to these ribosomes attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, rough endoplasmic reticulum here in longitudinal section, more cross sections here of smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Here's a longitudinal section of a, um, a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. No ribosomes on the smooth ER. Any questions? Okay, zymogen granules. So that's these um, granules down here and down here. We see in the GI tract, okay, um, this is a form of cellular inclusion that we see in the GI tract and we call them zymogen granules. Glycogen, okay, is an inclusion which is not membrane bound. So this particular stain um, stained red, it says he bests karma, and I'm really not sure the significance of that. Um, uh, aldehyde fusion, or PAS, is actually very good. Periodic acid shift is better for glycogen granules in the liver. Um, but it, always you see these vesicular structures staining up in the liver, which are the rounded glycogen granules. So here you can see nuclei of the hepatocytes of the liver surrounded by the glycogen granules in the cytoplasm. So that's a non-membrane bound inclusion in the liver. Questions? Here's more glycogen granules in periodic acid shift stained uh, liver section and stains up very pink, very prominent. Okay, questions? Lipid droplets, also non-membrane bound. Lipid droplets often, in the unilocular form, fill an entire adipocyte, which is a fat cell. So in this particular cell, the nucleus is squeezed out to the perimeter. The cytoplasm is in this small ring here. This is not just nuclear, uh, not just cytoplasmic um, cellular membrane. It's membrane plus um, bits of other cell organelles squeezed into this perimeter and the rest of the cell is filled with one large lipid droplet. Okay, and again, the lipid droplet is not membrane bound. Any questions? Okay, actin filaments. You can see these actin filaments in these two different cells. One is non-motile, the other is motile. So in the non-motile cell, the actin filaments um, permeate throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, they can act as stress fibers in the stationary cell. In a cell that's moving, you can see now the actin filaments um, are stained a much darker color at the very leading edge here because this cell is kind of inching along a substratum. You can see the fibrous nature of them, the streakiness, and here they're so dense, it's just one big condensed area of actin fibers, filaments, pulling the cell along. Any questions? Okay, so mitotic cells. Here we have a, a mitotic cell. Um, the nuclear membrane has disappeared. So this is all cytoplasm. The chromosomes are aligned along the equatorial plane. So this would be a metaphase. And at the end, we're gonna have a centrosome, two centrosomes at one end and the other. Remember, a centrosome is a pair of centrioles, which is called either a centrosome or a microtubule organizing center, which is what we call it during mitosis, or a mitotic organizing center. 
either is is good. Any question on this one? So then we have a prophase which precedes um, metaphase. So here we can see um, the cytoplasm of the cell, the nuclear membranes disappeared, and the chromosomes are just starting to condense in prophase in preparation for segregation during the process of cell division. This is an artifact of, so this is a scar, right? So this is a plant with a cell wall. So when they've dehydrated it, the cytoplasm is pulled away from the cell wall. So this is just space. This is cytoplasm. This is probably a piece of junk, dirt, or something that's stained, an artifact. Questions? So metaphase, now the chromosomes have aligned at the equatorial pole, equatorial plane, pardon me, not pole, plane. Here's one metaphase, here's another metaphase. Ascaris cell getting ready to be pulled apart. Questions on metaphase? You should be able to identify these different phases of mitosis, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Anaphase, the chromosomes have now been separated and diverging away from the equatorial plane. And here we can see this dot here on this dot here. This would be the centrosomes, the paired centrioles that make up the microtubule, the, 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 the microtubule organizing center. Questions on anaphase? When I was a high school student, we used to do this. I think this is ascaris, right? The plant, um, the, the teacher would give us a piece of ascaris and we'd fix it up and stain it with a little bit of dye and stick it under the microscope and it always came up really well. Always worked. Okay, telophase is the end of the process of mitosis in terms of the, the separation of the chromosomes. You can see the chromosomes have um, separated and now you're starting to get cytokinesis where the cytoplasm is starting to form this cleft or trough that's going to divide the cytoplasm into two different cells. Questions, telophase? Here's an electron micrograph, okay? You can see the mitotic spindle. These are microtubules, you'll recall. Okay, and then the chromosomes have uh, separated to opposite poles in this anaphase <coughs> cell. Questions? Microtubules, these the point of the microtubules are here. See these? These are all microtubules. So these are the railway tracks, these microtubules, along which the chromosomes bind and get pulled uh, to opposite directions. Other questions? Okay, so now um, different types of, let's see, what have we seen? Growth cone, electron micrograph, Oh, your philopodia. Okay, that's what they're showing here. So here's the cytoplasm of this cell growing in tissue culture, and you can see the philopodia. So remember, philopodia, these finger-like projections, are filled with actin filaments, right? Philopodia filled with actin filaments. And in an electron micrograph, this high-power electron micrograph with a high-voltage transmission electron micrograph, you can see these actin filaments permeating um, in this mesh-like network throughout the cytoplasm of this particular cell. Questions? Okay, so here we see um, a high power electron micrograph and we can see polyribosomes shown here adjacent to microfilaments shown here. So if it's a microfilament, if it's a filament, it would be actin. If it's a tubule, it would be tubulin of microtubules. So filament would be actin. Okay, questions? Um, the person that took this electron micrograph probably had microtubules elsewhere in the image and so they knew the diameter. So they knew this is a narrower diameter than the 
than the because the you know actin is around eight to ten micro uh, nanometers in diameter tubules are like 20 25 so it's like three times the diameter so then by looking elsewhere they'd know that this is actin rather than microtubules but just looking at it unless it was labeled you wouldn't be able to say definitively whether it was or not other questions okay so here we have a cell labeled with various structures so here's the nucleus this is the dark clumpy materials hetero the lighter material is U. Mitochondria, number two. Let me see, where is number two, mitochondria? This is kind of low power, so it's hard to pick out some of these structures. Number three is Ruffia. This looks like Ruffia to me. Is there a three? Is that a three? Probably is. Four is Golgi. Where is number four? This looks like it could be some Golgi over here. Number five is myelinated nerve. That's at the periphery, yeah. And six, synaptic vesicle. So this is kind of a neuro. Don't worry about the nervous stuff, but in here you can make out some of the cell organelles. Any questions on this one? Question, yeah? So number three is endoplasmic reticulum. So this looks like, I don't know if there's a three there. Is that, that looks like a three right there. Yeah. And that's rough endoplasmic reticulum. Other questions? Okay, here's more rough endoplasmic reticulum, again number three. Let's see, what are we labeling here? One is the nucleus, okay, here's the nucleus over here, mixture of hetero and euchromatin. Mitochondria is number two, okay, here's mitochondria, is there a two there? Here, here it is, here and here. Granular endoplasmic reticulum, that's an old term for rough endoplasmic reticulum, but they're the same thing. Here's rough ER, here's more rough ER. And four is the Golgi. This looks like Golgi, yeah. Golgi stacks shown here. Questions on this one? Okay, so more rough endoplasmic reticulum, very prominent. Okay, you can see how um, this rough endoplasmic reticulum shown here. And adjacent to it, this would be smooth ER. Okay, you can see there's no ribosomes there. So very clear distinction between both rough and smooth adjacent each other. Questions? Okay, here's another high power view of a cell. Nucleus, nucleolus. Um, let me see. Nucleolus labeled. Centriol. Here's a centriol, okay, kind of a low power. You'd have to look hard and know what you're looking for for the centriol. Golgi is number five. Golgi is number five. You can see some stacks there, but you'd really want to look at a higher power view to get a nice image of these. Yes. The centriol inside the nucleus. You only see the centrosome in the nucleus when the cell's dividing. When the cell's not dividing, I don't remember ever seeing any images of a centriol, so maybe it assembles. And it's not in the nucleus. Remember, when a cell is dividing, the nuclear membrane dissolves, and you have two separate poles. You have the centrosomes, the mitotic organizing centers at opposite poles, and then you have the microtubules form the mitotic spindle between the two centrosomes, and then you have the chromosomes aggregating and getting moved up and down along those microtubules. So the answer is no, there's no centrioles in the nucleus. You only see the centrioles in dividing cells when there is no nucleus or outside in the cytoplasm when there is a nucleus. In this particular case, it, it may, it's, it's hard to say, I mean, in a different plane, this is kind of oblique, in a different plane it could be attached to a um, cilia, right? You could have a non-motile cilia, because remember non-motile cilia, um, primary cilia, are used for um, sense, sensing adjacent cells. So, you know, the, in a different plane, there could be a cilia sticking out. Other questions? Okay, um, let me see. We've got a bunch of things going on here. Here's our mitochondria. 
here. Here's some rough ER here. Lipid droplets, okay? Lipid droplets, remember, they're non-membrane bound. And they can be confusing because they've got this dark stained perimeter around the edge. But that's not a membrane. That is just a characteristic of how lipid droplets will stain with uranyl acetate and lead citrate in these electron micrographs. So get familiar with that so that you can identify a lipid droplet from some membrane-bound vesicle like a lysosome or endocytic vesicle or something like that. Questions? Um, another higher uh, power view. A lot of mitochondria here. See this mitochondria? All these mitochondria. And this looks like smooth ER. Is that what it says? Number two. No, it says Golgi. Golgi here. Maybe over here, smooth ER. And here, Golgi stacks are there, yeah. Microtubules, number four. Number four, has anyone seen number four? Right up here. Okay, these, yes, striated, these long structures here. A few microtubules. And five is lipid, okay, lipid droplet. You can kind of make out that darker stain perimeter, not as prominent as the previous slide. Okay, any que yes, question? The high concentration of mitochondria. In this particular cell, this is a granulosa cell which is producing steroids, so um, of the female reproductive tract. So it would be very active in steroidogenesis. And that's why you've got a large number of mitochondria in this particular cell. Okay, question, more questions? Okay, there you go. So, here's our question. Which of the following is not, not being the operative word, associated with microtubules? Microtubules. Basal body, centriole, stereocilia, Axoneme, centrosome. C is correct. Remember, stereocilia is a misnomer. They are very long, skinny microvilli that we see in locations like the epididymis and um, the um, part of the, the inner ear. Okay, guys, that's it for today. There may be still some free food outside. And I will see you, I think this is a long weekend this weekend, right? Yeah, so it's time for a break, and I will see you next Wednesday for Connective Tissue and Cartilage. Enjoy the weekend.